Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, <laughs> good morning here at this particular time when I'm doing this. This is Stephen Gray, and uh, this is uh, the Stephen Gray Vision YouTube channel, purpose of which is to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, interview uh, leading spokespeople in fields related to psychedelics and consciousness transformation. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, in case I forget at the end, I'd also encourage you to uh, take a look at the website, stephengrayvision.com, and sign up for my newsletter. It's free, and I don't use it all that often. Uh, so uh, just trying to do our little bit here to further the development of uh, wisdom on this planet uh, by interviewing these kinds of people. And um, I'm really happy to have with me uh, uh, quite a brilliant long, young woman uh, named Acacia Lewis. Uh, and I'm going to start by reading her uh, bio from our conference, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. Oh, and by the way, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference will be coming up again in November, first to third in Vancouver at spiritplantmedicine.com. And uh, Acacia, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, I, I'm the one who uh, chooses the speakers for the conference. Last year I did something which I've only done once or twice before in all of the 12 years I've been doing this, and that is I um, asked her if she would do two talks last year because she has so much to say about these kinds of things, these issues, and um, uh, I and the rest of the people who attended the conference were so impressed with what she did share last year that I invited her to come back and speak again at this year's conference. Conference, and she said yes. So um, uh, I'm going to again just read you this quick bio from the conference, and it says uh, she's a founder, the founder of Divine Mastery Alchemy LLC and Divine Master University, a school for entheogenic cultural literacy and applied neuropathic medicine research. Acacia is a student of Baba Kalindi Iyi and teachers from other systems, as well as an independent researcher and lifetime student of the psilocybin mushroom. She shares her first-hand experience and provides undergraduate level research papers, books, and some medical research to help excuse me, <clears throat> to help bridge and integrate the fields of medical science, spiritual systems, and cultural anthropology. Well, that's a bit of a mouthful, full, <laughs> uh, but that's fine. Uh, so, um, welcome. Thank you so much for having me again, Stephen. Well, delighted. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> uh, that is a definite mutual feeling on this end as well. Uh, so let's just get right into it then. And I'm going to uh, sort of throw the big question at you right off the bat. Um, so uh, perhaps I'll make it into a sort of a two-part question. Oh, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm familiar with your thinking and the way that your mind works and so on. And I just want to say that you have as long a leash as you need. Please feel free to take any question I ask and go anywhere you want with it for as long as you want. And I'll just sit back and enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you said something, you, I think you titled one of your talks, How Mushrooms Can Help humans evolve, right? Um, yes. And then a little later in that talk, you also made a reference to the note, uh, this is more or less your phrase, that our, meaning our Western kind of modern culture, so to speak, um, thinking uh, our lens of reality is flawed. So, so when I thought of this question, how mushrooms can help humans evolve, I thought, well, Evolve is a really interesting word in that sentence, right? So the question that comes to my mind is evolve from what to what? And so that, that's why I say it's a kind of a two-part question. Uh, so if that would be the first part would be evolve from what to, to to what? And then the second part would be how the mushrooms uh, can help with that. Ooh, that is a really, really beautiful question. Thank you so much for bringing that up because I've thought about this question a lot in my own explorations. And the consensus that I've come to is we are not really um, coming or going anywhere, you see. A lot of us think that, you know, we need somehow more neurons in our brain to actualize compassion. And that's not really true. We've got humans on the planet who are perfectly compassionate, altruistic, and morally uh, uh, um, 
upstanding. And then we've got another group of humans over here who really are destructive and quite toxic, you know? And so it's not necessarily, I think, our physiology that needs evolution. It's our our knowledge of our own selves that needs a overhaul or at least a better looking at, you know? And um, evolution suggests that there's something broken about what we are. Actualization is more of the word that I'm looking at now. Mm. To self-actualize rather than to evolve. To self-actualize means to uh, come into a greater knowing and capacity for awareness within the self of its own true nature. And I think that psychedelics, specifically the psilocybin mushroom, can help us to explore the internet of our inner nature, uh, of our potential to be uh, compassionate, divine, uh, loving beings that have the best interest of others at heart, as well as ourselves. Uh, but I think that's our true nature that has been overwritten or overwritten by uh, many, many, many different uh, wars and, and traumas and uh, I guess you could say uh, a dominant Western worldview. That dominant Western worldview forces us to, uh, I, I, I found this word that I thought was really interesting, uh, philofiction. <laughs> we fictionalize our uh, inner experiences as a as if. We, we put them as a separate experience from our humanity uh, rather rather uh, fanatically and and we look to other cultures or to other spiritual traditions to somehow validate our inner world rather than simply uh enjoying the experience of it and it being perfectly valid in and of itself standing on its own two legs as just part of our humanity uh the psychedelic experience is oftentimes fictionalized and fantasized about as if it's uh some lofty goal of humanity rather than a part of our life and our experience here, mm. you know, um, starting off with the fact that we in the West many times are born into a dualist type fantasy. We, we, we are, we come into this world and in kindergarten, we learn, you know, there's nouns, there's verbs, there's adjectives. We learn labels and that's how we associate with our external reality. And even though we can feel maybe there's an energy from the stone that's interacting with us, there's an ontology of the natural world that maybe uh, we're not exploring. We're never, sat down generally like i guess in 2024 it's different you have <laughs> Waldorf schools and montessori schools and other schools that i guess are training children at a very young age to connect with nature and and their spiritual side but the way that uh, i grew up in the early 2000s and 1990s is you know uh very much uh there's a box this is how the box operates uh, you're inside this box, and this is the the lens of reality that we're going to give you as correct. This is what sane people see reality as. <laughs> and if, if you if you squiggle outside that box, you might have a mental issue. You might have a mental disorder. You know, and yeah. I think and that psychedelics. Least, at the very least, you're not going to be encouraged for it, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're going to go. You know, if you, if the three. Your difficult if you're. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know, the three-year-old the three -year -old says, oh, guess what I just saw, you know, like, not in the material world, mommy. And she'll go, oh, you have such a wild imagination, dear. Exactly. Right? You know, yeah. I saw a unicorn, mommy. You know, I think uh, there's this uh, movie called, uh, oh, it's actually a TV show now, Percy Jackson, The Lightning Thief. And you have this uh, mm -hmm. young man who's living out the archetype of Perseus, who's the son of Poseidon. And in this uh, in this TV show, uh, it's based on uh, early Greek mythology. Uh, Perseus is a young man who sees unicorns and sees rhinoceroses dressed up in celestial armor, and he tells his teachers, and you know he gets sent to a, a special school. And then after he gets sent to a special school, he gets taken and kidnapped by his celestial family and sent to a camp for demigods, hmm. where. All of these other kids know that this is true, what they've been seeing all of these years. They've been seeing all sorts of entities and celestial creatures, but no one in the human world acknowledges its existence. So to protect the humans from the demigods, they have their own school. They have their own camp for demigods. And I feel like uh, psilocybin is kind of like that camp 
for demigods. We go, <laughs> we go mm. into this experience where a lot of the things that we've been feeling or sensing now become some sort of uh, uh, narrative. We were able to connect with our narrative on a level of self-truth and self-actualization. And we we love to, to cling and flock to other groups that are also willing to look at their, their inner realms as a part of their humanity rather than as some sort of offshoot of a psychedelic trip that was just had. People who embody uh, the the instructions or or the visions or the inspiration and creativity that uh, flows freely from this infinite expansive awareness that we've suddenly found ourselves uh, in communion with through psychedelic use mm. and uh, we found safety in those groups many times you know and so I say all that to say uh, to to answer the question I think it's really cultivating this deeper awareness of self that is the evolution. And the way that mushrooms or psychedelics can help us to do that is by collapsing our inner waveform, if you will, and and going into the infinite awareness and exploring what that is, uh, rather than getting locked in our own thoughts and emotions and kind of the uh, finite existence, you know, a certain dose of pretty much several of the, the classic psychedelics, LSD, mescaline, mushrooms, ayahuasca, I hate to lump them into a group, but if you take a significant dose, it's going to alter significantly your inner world view. What you thought was important before the experience may go flying out the window. You know? mm -hmm. And so um, let's let's talk yeah. at that at this point then a little bit about dosage because you you've uh, it's an important issue that you've spoken about. You spoke about it at the conference even. Somebody mm -hmm. asked you a question at the end of your talk at the conference about uh, you know this issue of high doses, and I know you've spoken about um uh your you know your mentor uh Kalindi e uh being uh, an advocate for, for himself anyway and perhaps for his students of uh, what most people consider extremely high doses of 20 grams dried grams or more even i thought it, you i heard you say 40 but maybe i mm -hmm. just heard yeah, yeah. um 40 so, <laughs> yeah, where important. Terrence McKenna um, called five dried grams a heroic or committed dose that would flatten the most resistant ego, is kind of the way he put it. But then your answer was really interesting, uh, where you said it, it depends on a number of factors, and for some people even one dried gram might be a high dose. But can you talk a little bit about... Uh, how to learn the best from these mushrooms related to the dosage issue. Okay, well, uh, part of the issue is that um, we live in a world that treats the mushroom as a drug. Uh, because the mushroom has been drugified, um, you know, five grams seems like a lot of a substance, but if you understand the metabolization process of psilocybin and all of the moving parts, and uh, the fact that psilocybin and psilocin um, content varies quite a bit between mushroom strains. I actually really, you know, suggest that they take as small amount as they can that's, that's perceptible or perceivable first to get to know what kind of entity they're really dealing with here. I had a friend call me the other night. He's a student of mine. He said, you know, Acacia, I've just been having some difficult journeys. I'm trying to use this mushroom to uh, make my music really beautiful and great. You know, I'm trying to to be a creative here and, a, and, a, and an artist, and it won't let me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I go to a mm -hmm. concert, and I, I eat my mushrooms, and it, everything, I, it feels like I'm not really enjoying the experience, and mm -hmm. it's just suddenly been like this for like the last three months. And I told him, you do realize that this uh this psilocybin mushroom it it has its own intelligence right he said well kind of and i said well had you thought about uh trying to connect with its intelligence you know letting it be known that you are aware of the fact that it possesses a spirit and uh, maybe trying to connect with that spirit to see if it has anything else it would like to show you or mm -hmm. or talk to you about besides your music career. Had you thought about that? He mm -hmm. said, well, no, not really. And I said, well, you see, in my, my experience, uh, 
this mushroom is millions of years old and it has its own ontological awareness that seems to open up to me when I'm in periods of at least some form of human humanity and humility uh, when I when I put myself in the background or after an ego death when I'm finally willing to open my my inner ears and listen to what it might have to share with me uh, that it can be quite insightful but uh, that the persona the persona does require a certain amount of respect you know you can't just uh, say give me this in my mm. trip and just get that and um, he's like well I thought it was all in my mind Hmm. And I said that's what most of the West thinks too. You know? Right. Yeah. That's just all in your head. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's not a uh, spiritual exchange. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I used to go to a lot of Native American church peyote prayer ceremonies, and the road man mm -hmm. that ran a lot of those meetings, um, he was a wonderful wise man, uh, once said to us. A lot of times when I t share this with people, they kind of look a little bit puzzled at first because they don't understand the both literal and metaphorical um, aspect of it. But I'm, I know you will uh, when I say that what he said was relatives stay behind the medicine. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> stay yeah. behind the medicine. And most people don't understand that. Like, like we had sweat lodge two days ago. It was a seven hour, five round lodge. It was for an elder who's about 70 years old and He's a dear friend of mine, and we sat in uh, we sat in the Anipi with him for five rounds. And I remember having the experience where the the road woman, this was actually a woman who led this sweat for one of the first sweats I've ever been at, where there was an elder female mm -hmm. as as the uh, as the road woman for the for the sweat, and she said, "Stay behind the ancestors. We communicate with the fire." and the Anipi to the ancestors and they come and they bring their medicine. Don't get out in front of the ancestor spirits. And that's same exactly applies Ken, for... Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's exactly what Ken said. You get out in front of that medicine, also, you know, um, medicine in this case, not just being the literal grandfather peyote, but of course, you know, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but mm -hmm. for people watching or listening to this, um, it also um, refers to, um, I don't know how to put it exactly, I'm sure you could put it more eloquently, but the, the, the um, unconditional wisdom altogether of the mm -hmm. natural uh, movement of, of intelligence and energy, right? It, when oh, we yes. get in front of it, then we mess everything up. I have a psychic uh, uh, colleague who says the intellect is the source. The intellect is the source of all the problems on this planet. Not that the intellect in itself, um, you know, everything about the everything that comes in our minds causes the problem. But that's when there is a problem. It's because we've gotten out in front of the medicine, right? Yes, and I think that we in the West, without training, you know, the first thing we want to do is try to get out in front of it and try to negotiate the experience for ourselves. Mm. We think that we know best. We're taught that if we don't know best, then there might be an inadequacy and that fear of inadequacy or that fear of not knowing what's best, that fear to explore, I think is what limits uh, the the efficacy of psychedelics, you know, and most Westerners. And so that's why I brought up the journey of the deified heart in my other lectures, because the contextual non uh, non philo fictional point of uh, duplicative uh, stories about psychedelics because we can talk about you know the western view of just ego death all day until our, our we're blue in the face <laughs> but these these contextual traditions you know like the dharmakaya truth body of the buddha or you know tantric uh, kundalini awakening there are there are systems standalone systems that can claim the psilocybin mushroom as an original uh teacher that are extremely complex and vast in their understanding of the of these deeper experiences, you know. And I think we run the risk of um, of taking away from its wisdom when we put ourselves in the position of the negotiator, you know. Like I want to control my trip. This is what I want from my trip. 
And I think Westerners are trained to say, well, what are your intentions instead of what are spirits intentions? Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, you know, um, whenever I take a mushroom trip, the first thing I ask the mushroom is what can, what can I do for you? And what, what can, what can I learn? What do I have to, to learn here? I, I automatically put myself in the back seat. I'm like, I'm going for a ride in your car. <laughs> right now i put the mushrooms in my body and my body is your car right now mm -hmm. and that's while i'm still in this illusory duality and at some point in that experience i know that what i thought was its car and what i thought was it is going to merge and we're going to travel together as a we as a great we you know because it seems to be the key that unlocks the flesh to the greater vast ocean of awareness and when you unlock that uh that flesh body identity of self and actualize into a greater self that is uh infinite in its uh capacity for uh expression you get so much depth out of it mm -hmm. you know on a soul or what you call spiritual level that's unexplainable people who have these experiences oftentimes come away saying oh my god mm -hmm. i'm god you know and they they might just stop there and get caught in the awe but my teacher glenny said don't get caught on the awe mm -hmm. you know just just observe you know don't get caught in the awe because if you get caught in the awe it's like taking yourself out of that car and you're you're looking at it saying wow that's me you know and then we have mr me seeks like from rick and morty <laughs> and mr me seeks says look at me i'm mr me seeks <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and 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 then we have the people who are who are saying this is me look at me i'm mr me seeks i'm god <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know and so you have two problem. paths yes it is it is kind of problematic because if the identity of mr me seeks becomes dual again in the mm -hmm. process of awakening the awakening hasn't been fully embodied in the present mm -hmm. you're trying to look towards the future to say this is what i was or this is what i can become instead of being yeah or you're saying look at it that's what it is. It's not me. Yeah. But there's also a danger of, um, as you've implied quite clearly, actually, of uh, um, uh, using these insights to bolster the ego. And that's one thing when you're doing that on your own. But if you're then deciding, you know, you're sort of special and you know you're now the expert and you're going to run ceremonies and so on and so on that can be particularly problematic i'm starting to hear this is a this is something that kind of new to me i'm starting to hear from several different sources of people that are involved with reliable um, contexts and i actually want to ask you a little bit about containers and contexts and rituals and stuff in a minute too but um uh they're saying that a lot of people that are coming to them now are coming to them wounded or hurt from other ceremonial situations they've been in um so there's a lot there seems to be a lot of it going on having said that i want to you know circle back to the question from about 60 seconds ago uh i'm guessing that you uh you know are fine taking the mushrooms on your own uh there's a lot of talk these days and has been for a number of years now about the importance of set and setting and so i'm wondering what your take is on um uh I'm sure there's no one simple answer, but uh, um, you know, the uh, having a guide, a sitter, a ceremonialist, a therapist, etc., to be there for your journey. Well, I think that sometimes stability matters, you know, and uh, set and setting based around stability oftentimes leads to a stable result. 
set and setting based around instability, too many flashing lights, TV going, music blaring in the background leads to unstable results. Mm -hmm. And so trying to define for myself, what is, what is stable? What do I, what is my subconscious think stable is? Cause that's what really matters when you, when you enter that kind of hyper suggestible phase where you're around someone, let's say they've got a giant mole on their cheek. You're going to be like a kid like hyper fixating on that giant mole on their cheek. And, it, and it, they could be the most beautiful, perfect sitter ever. But because you're looking at their face and because you're curious now, your curiosity has been opened up, your your hyper suggestibility is, is, is on tilt. You're not focused on yourself, focused on this, this guy, what he smells like, what he looks like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, how you feel about it. And it keeps you locked in this, 3d world you know i feel like when you have someone right in front of you and so kalindi would always say you need a trip server for the three five seven and nine but after you go past nine grams mm. you need to trip by yourself because he says as long as there's somebody in the room with you the mask is always going to be on the mask of i can't cry because of this or i can't express mm. because of this and i'm i'm concerned about how i might be perceived it's i i i i i loop and wouldn't that be a, an issue of trust, though? For example, in the um, I imagine you're familiar with the uh, work that they've been doing over the last 20 years at Johns Hopkins University uh, and uh, their protocol, their methodology has been where they uh, have several sessions with the with the uh, the journeyer ahead of time, uh, develop that trust. They have the person in the room where they're eventually going to do the psilocybin journey so that they become familiar with the room and they make it comfortable, you know, put some flowers in, have soft lighting, you know, that kind of thing. And then when the actual journey happens, they've got eye shades on and a playlist and the sitter or guide is just stays out of it unless you do something like suddenly decide you want to jump up and you know call 911 you know but uh right otherwise yeah, what they I'm just talking leave you without alone an eye shade you know like yeah. if you if you got your eyes open and there's no yeah. eye shade then it, it can go left just based on appearances exactly, um yeah. if you have an eye shade on then it's okay but you see you have people like me who don't like to feel something on their face oh. when they're tripping Huh. And it, it's really like, it's glaring. It's not cool. Like the feeling of like the restriction around my eyes is its own trip for me. And even if I have something like comfortable on, mm -hmm. just the feeling of something over my eyes, like that's why darkness works better for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. you know, or really low light. And no music so My either. eyes get no music. Or if I have music, it doesn't have any words. And it's like frequencies of, mm -hmm. of music. Mm. Um, just because I am hyper sensitive, like sensitive to the point of, you know, a bird could land on the balcony and I'm two rooms away and I can perceive the bird on, on the balcony. Mm. And so you see, you have levels when you get to the higher doses, like yeah. nine grams plus, you might be seeing through walls, the trip sitters. On the other side of the wall, whatever energy they inhabit or whatever sphere they inhabit permeates the space energetically. It's not even so much about trusting someone. It's about what they carry into the space for me. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. You know, I could trust my best friend, but let's say he just went through a breakup, you know, and he's mm -hmm. cool now, mm -hmm. but he has a lot of unforgiveness or anxiety and his body is just kind of... He, he's not feeling well or something because of something that happened. I will feel that in him. I'll feel it in my own journey, you know? And because most of the time when I journey, I end up having this cataclysmic type. Uh, it, it's like looking through glass. When I trip at a high dose, I can see my body, but it's like a hologram. Mm. And I can see the world around me, but it's holographic in nature. Mm. And so it's like somebody turned the shading down, the opacity down on reality. And through that translucence, my awareness is able to slip out into the world around me and explore kind of just infinitely if I want to. But the, the implication I'm getting from this too is that <clears throat> 
Uh, this is for people who know themselves well. I mean, these higher dose journeys, especially alone, mm -hmm. you know, you have to know that you're not going to um, be caught by, you talk about in your talk mind. About, yeah, and, you, and caught by fear, you know, that, you know, like, oh, you're terrified because you've just seen the demon and you're going to, you know, jump out the window or call 911 or something like that. Oh, you yeah, no, this is for people who yourself, know they are, right? they're, they're also the demon. This is for people who know that demon is, is a part of the experience and that they're not afraid of it. They, they've integrated the shadow. <laughs> Like that's what the three, five, seven, and nine are ideally for in Baba Kalindi's protocol is that you really get comfortable with the self. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like you you know yourself to the extent that you know you're not gonna do anything crazy that you wouldn't do if you're just stone cold sober. Mm -hmm. And that takes at least two or three years to develop in my experience. Mm -hmm. It's not something that just you can't just go boom 20. <laughs> Like somebody told me they did 30 grams and shit themselves. This is, this has happened. Oh yeah. Baba Kalindi said you needed to do 30 grams. And then of course this person also had a very difficult experience, but mm -hmm. claimed that it taught them how to breathe and all of this stuff. You learned how to breathe on three, not on 30, on three. Mm. And the reason you learn how to breathe on 30 is so that if there's some sort of, yeah, on three grams, you learn how to breathe on three grams so that you can get into your physical body your whole body you can leave this stinky thing mm -hmm. and like embody the awareness of physically existing like in this material world and through the breath you tr you carry your awareness deeper into your stomach if there's discomfort in your stomach you might explore why and reflect on what you've been eating reflect on the inconsistencies you've had maybe in your diet and exercise your physical health dealing with the state of affairs physically if you don't deal with that on a low dose on a high dose it could be fatal i can't mm. imagine someone discovering that they have cancer on 30 dried grams like i discovered i had tumors in my ovaries i could see them i could feel them i could feel the oh. discomfort mm. and it was it was terrible you know but i'm glad i did it on a low dose because on a low dose, I know it's going to be over in four hours and I, I can go get checked out. I can make a game plan. I can pray about it. You know, I can consult my, my, my parents. I can be like, I think there's something wrong that needs to be looked at. And then that can be verified rather than me hysterically go going into a state of fear and uh, I, I unrest thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. You know, just mm -hmm. end it already. You know, I can't imagine somebody who's already like freaked out by seeing something in them that may very well be real, mm. feeling it, feeling the pain and <clears throat> discomfort physically from it and being overcome mm. by it. I would never wish mm. that on anyone. Mm -hmm. So caution is people... really <clears throat> discretion, caution, well prepared, all really important. So for, for those people that, you know, are prepared and can handle these larger doses, uh, um, I'd be, I'd, I'd like to hear, uh, I'd like you to share, if you will, more about mm -hmm. where that can go. Like, for example, in the, in the conference Ooh. talk, you talked about, um, being able to travel in both time and space. So yeah. I guess my question is, what's the value? What's the utility of doing that? Fix your life the long way, like fix the life of yourself, fix your family's lives, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. The amount of work I've done for my parents is, it's just unreal. You know, like my dad, for my dad to say he's proud of me for getting into a psychedelic facilitatorship program. Like that was a, that was a success for me this week. You know, I got a scholarship for Naropa and I've always wanted to go to Naropa for different reasons. Mm. Uh, Naropa is in uh, Shangpa Kagyu traditional lineage and I'm in the Karma Kagyu buddhist traditional lineage and so i've always wanted to go to the translating school there uh, check it out um, but for my dad to say that to me like the amount of work that has been done completely sober after mushroom trips after consulting uh my past to see where we got off on the wrong foot to see where my own actions resulted and the feelings of another person being discredited or un devalued the ability to go back in time in my own physical life was paramount but not only that to go back in time with my teacher to see who he was when he was my age mm. 
it was encouraging to me because I, I had this notion in my head that many people will say, of course, it's false, but it's easy to pedestalize somebody who you see as a teacher, right? And think they don't have the same kind of problems as me. They have it all figured out. You know, it's an easy, fallacious place to go, but many people go there in, in a variety of settings, you know, mm -hmm. not just in psychedelics, but see, oh, you've grappled with anger too. You've grappled with money problems too. You, you, you've dealt with all of this stuff too. And I'm perfectly fine right where I'm at today, at this age, at this time. I don't have to be this grandiose figure right now because you were never that grandiose figure. It was just an illusion of my mind to create that because of my own lack of self-knowledge. When I came into my own self-knowledge, I came into self-acceptance, you know, of the way things are being divine, just the way they are, not having to be dolled up or prettied up or, you know, or exaggerated to feel beautiful, but to accept reality as it is, the way it presents itself, still being inseparable from a divine expression as myself, mm -hmm. you know, um, embracing the awkwardness of life. Mm -hmm. got rid of a lot of my deeper anxiety that I was mm -hmm. inadequate and my own Western inadequacy taught me that a lot of people deal with this stress induced behavioral deficit mm -hmm. and the stress induced behavioral deficit and rats, at least psilocybin can ameliorate. It can help with significantly. Really? You know, there's yeah. the studies out here. I, I challenge all of the viewers to go and just look up psilocybin in quotes plus NCBI plus scholarly 2024. Look at all of the research that's just coming out about psilocybin therapy and you will be shocked. Mm -hmm. From quantum physics to cognitive behavioral analysis and different studies that have been done on the stress levels and uh, social deficits, et cetera, psilocybin is winning as far as like a, a treatment, which I think is mm -hmm. really beautiful. Yeah. God, I got so many questions for you. There's no way I'm going to get them all in. Uh, um, uh, so let me just fire a couple of random ones here, so to speak. Uh, one of them is um, um, uh, method methods of doing this. And you've spoken about, uh, I think, uh, Kalindi also uh, um, promoted uh, this idea of, or actually not Kalindi, maybe he did too, but uh, Tom Lane uh, likes mm -hmm. this idea of um, chewing the mushrooms with honey for a long time. Um, and um, I, I think he even said in, in his book or somewhere that he, you don't even necessarily have to swallow them at that point. But um, what's the advantage of doing that? Well, glucose carries uh, the psilocin through the mucous membrane in the mouth, yeah. you know? And the problem is when you swallow psilocybin mushrooms, your liver has to produce enzymes, you know? And so if you have a citric honey, it already has like the citric acid in it, you know, vitamin C, and it's like lemon teching and adding glucose to the psil psilocin and the glucose molecules help to carry the psilocin through the mucous membrane directly into the bloodstream. And so you feel the come up while you're chewing it. It's a really r bizarre feeling because most people feel like they have to wait for the come up five to 10 minutes, 15 minutes for the liver uh, to produce enzymes, to break down psilocybin into psilocin for the first pass to take place, for it to enter the blood brain barrier, for you to digest it or metabolize it. Chewing it in the mouth, you know, that's why, you know, you got all these images with things with teeth, big chompers, you know, like, like the wind up chompers from Pixar, you know, going you see those 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 creatures and the Aztec glyphs like literally there's a creature that it's just disembodied chompers you know and the Aztecs and Mayans had a tradition even the Olmecs of carving geometric patterns into the teeth you know and these geometric patterns were like bling almost I feel like you know for chewing the psilocybin mushroom areas mm -hmm. where the psilocybin could like travel into because you feel it in your teeth like in your bones it's, mm -hmm. it's the most bizarre feeling it's like sensitive but not painful it's a sensitizing feeling that you get in your teeth between your gums and it draws like all of your focus right there. Mm -hmm. And so because you're, it's like there's two sets of eyes uh, inside your mouth looking out and you have these pictures of like the, the dragon Quetzalcoatl on the stells of Xochitl Calico with literally a little guy hanging out of the mouth of a giant dragon with big teeth, <laughs> mm. you know, and you can relate to this so much because your eye soul is like right there 
in your mouth watching this chewing process and then because you no longer identify with the flesh automatically you're able to travel outside of it you're, you're able to explore you know using the breath the breath carries it and the breath transforms into this serpent uh plumed be plumed feathered serpent that is quetzalcoatl you know and that's mm -hmm. literally a whole nother step above kundalini expression for for my own personal experience because you don't just see it it's like an earthquake inside of your body of just mm -hmm. fiery breath that comes <clears throat> comes out from uh your root and just spirals around your your spine and it's literally like a manifestation of vibrant rainbow color and it comes out of your mouth and and you you're you're in the ocean of awareness traveling on the back of this dragon you know but you're you're inseparable from it it's not the whole idea of being just a physical flesh body will melt away you're just a skull at that point and the skull just dies and falls back and you're just like wait i'm still alive i can see my hands but i'm traveling as my awareness hyper focused in this moment towards infinity oh amazing so i mean can that happen on lower doses even or does that oh yeah. yeah i i eat one <laughs> mushroom in uh oh. oaxaca one and oh. i i could barely get through the whole thing amazing and, and, yeah. and, and literally like like you know how you get like the uh <laughs> like the body load come up where, where you just you're just sitting there and you can't move <laughs> Uh, like like I couldn't move my physical body. Like after chewing it for a couple of minutes, I was like, oh, oh. snap, it's already here. That's amazing. And you know, oh. it was a fresh mushroom. Granted, I think mm -hmm. it was um Zapotecorum or one of the Darumbe species, one of the stronger ones. It was a little hongos. Mm -hmm. And it was black with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at a fire and it took me all the way there to the point where I had to lay down sideways in the bed. And it was like fire, like blue fire <clears throat> was coursing through my body. Just infinite, infinite loop of expanding awareness and energy. It was, it was like sticking your finger in a bliss socket. <laughs> That's remarkable. So here's another practical question. Uh, up our way here in the Vancouver area, I'm starting to hear more and more people mixing uh, Syrian rue in with it. Uh, but I asked somebody, and you know, it might even have been you. I can't remember it mm -hmm. last year. I asked somebody about that, and they said they didn't like that idea. And I think the main reason was because Syrian rue is uh, kind of a stimulant in itself. Um, but do you, yeah. what's your take on the inclusion of uh, Syrian rue with the mushroom? Come back to me about it in a year because it's in Egypt, you have different effigies that show Beset with a mushroom upside down on her head and Bess, the god of Syrian Ru. And there are consorts, one's a lion-headed man and one is a lion-headed woman. And eventually in later mythologies, she becomes the goddess of healing. Her, her evil sister, evil twin, uh, becomes kind of a metaphor for women's periods and, and hormones, etc. And Bess is the protector of women and children used in childbirth to release the placenta from the walls uh, when, when a woman is giving birth. It's used as a kind of, uh, um, not an abortificant, it could be used that way, but generally during childbirth it would be used. Um, or the effigy would be placed somewhere near the woman giving birth to help her feel more protected. I've yet to fully understand, and I, I don't mind saying I don't know, because something weird happened when I took Syrian root in a low dose with psilocybin, right? And that weird thing that happened was so profound that I cannot say that I didn't like the experience. I called Kalindi after that experience, mm. and I haven't had an experience with just, with just Syrian root and mushrooms ever since. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had Syrian root with acacia, and that was a week-long trip. I'm still finding what ratios work. I think it's a dose thing and how you prepare the Syrian root. Because you can prepare it like coffee. You can grind it up and drink the grounds, you know, as like a hot, chocolatey, it's like very bitter chocolate, kind of musty like tobacco, too. Mm -hmm. And it tasted good. And I enjoyed the experience when I did it with acacia. 
Uh, but it was like my body was nuking DMT molecule. It was like mushroom clouds of just boom visual. It, it was it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in a trip before. And I also swallowed the bark as well with the acacia trip. But with the Syrian root trip I did with mushrooms, I just chewed a couple of the seeds, just like three. That was it. And I did the mushroom, but it enhanced my ability to travel and navigate inside the mushroom as far as going to universes outside of what could be the context for this one. It could be stuff inside our known universe on, on a micro. It could be on a macro. I'm not completely sure. Uh, because it was just so profound, uh, the experience that I had. Mm. And I think there's a great potential there, but it deserves more study as far mm. as the mechanics, because no one can really agree what dose of Syrian rue really goes with the psilocybin mushroom. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in the next year, I'm going to probably trial it a little bit more, especially mm. because I'll be working with other acacia species, including acacia nilotica seeds. I'll be able to tell you more if 0.5 is too much. I think 0.5 grams of Syrian root seed could be too much. Mm. If you look at a Syrian root seed pot, it has like six seeds in it, I think. Mm. Uh, two on each side of a, a bulbous chamber of three. Yeah. Or, yeah, two, four, six. So six seeds. And I think there might be something to eating just six seeds instead of trying to weigh it in grams yeah. because the MAOI is so strong. You know, you don't, MAOI just opens the floodgates. You don't need to overdose an MAOI, I think, with the mushroom. I just think you just need to trigger the flood floodgates to open. Yeah, for you know, clarity so, for people that aren't familiar with it, MAOI refers to- I can't to hear mono. you right now. Let me see if I oh. can- Oh, one second. Can you hear me now? Yes, I could hear you all along. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Uh-oh. <laughs> Minor technical problem here, folks. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, good. Yeah, I was going to say just for uh, anyone uh, watching or listening to this who's not familiar with the term, uh, that refers to monoamine oxidase inhibitor, M-A-O-I. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we're pro probably getting close to where might be a you know, reasonable time to let people go and think about this amazing material you've shared. I want to take it to a bigger level for a moment, and I don't even know if you, I haven't heard you speak about this, so I, I don't even know if you have any uh, views or thoughts on this following issue, but I'll ask it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's, I'm going to have to start with a, a short uh, proclamation, not proclamation, a couple of thoughts here. Uh, I've I've been paying attention lately to what seemed to be the almost overwhelming um, uh, deteriorating problems on the material level on the planet. Uh, there are people who are uh, studying this quite carefully, and they're saying that we might be heading toward system collapse in the very near future. And so part of what occurs to me as I as I ponder that possibility that most metrics associated with economic, social, climate are all, you know, going in the wrong direction, so to speak, is that um, uh, how much of an influence, a beneficial influence, can the wise, skillful, intentional use of psychedelics have on this sort of larger problem? You know, there are some stories about Tibet that make this seem okay. You know, Tibet was at war before Padma Sambhava came and uh, introduced Buddhism to the Bon people. And there, it's said that Tibet would be uninhabitable if the demons had not been pacified in that space. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. No, I'm uh, not. I, I know a tiny bit about Padma Sambhava. Um, right, the lotus he found, Yeah, and, and one of my favorite... Uh, uh, you know that um, little aphorisms. I gather he, he they wrote down a lot of what he said, and he had these little like quatrains or whatever. And <clears throat> the one that's always blown me away is like, how could he have possibly known this? Something like, um, when horses run on wheels and the iron bird flies, the Tibetan people will be scattered to the ends of the earth, and Buddhism will come to the land of the red man. Yeah, I feel like that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And um, 
here, I, 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 I gotta just be frank with you. Let's just speak on a very real level. There are beings that have visited the Aztec people called Nahual. The Nahual people are the cloud people that are said to have arrived and they, they shape shift, et cetera. And they have a benevolence about them. They're not a war loving people. They're a wise, they're sages. They're, they're the beings who came to teach the sages inside of the journey of the deified heart. We have time people that exist outside of this dimension. I'm not going to call them aliens, but I will call them time persons. That's how Tom Lane in his book describes them is as time persons, avatars. And I believe that in Tibetan Buddhism, they really were able to hone in on and listen to these avatars as, as deified forms, sometimes being considered uh, beings that visited or beings that were self-generated, i.e. through Tantra, through uh, transformation. And I think sometimes there was entheogens involved in those transformations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there are sacrifices that have to be made as far as our, our ego mind, our, our dedication to peace-lovingness. Our dedication to world peace really and having that become part of our dominant culture here in the west and i think that i don't want to see things get as bad as they were in other places before we all make a unanimous commitment to listening to these time beings i've seen societies rise and collapse and really making a change about what we prioritize in our society do we, mm -hmm. do we prioritize materialism and war over peace and success? And if we really do prioritize materialism and war, I think that uh, the practitioners of this era are going to need to skillfully subdue a lot of these uh, warlike entities that, uh, that seem to be controlling the narrative of how where the world is going. And how could that happen? Uh, well, as Kalindi put it, we need more warriors. Mm -hmm. This space of awareness is dense. The, the, the veil is very thin, you know? And, uh, you know, our president and other world leaders could probably use some spiritual assistance, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, their decision-making. Now, spiritual assistance doesn't have to be verbal, you know? You don't have to try to convince someone to do the right thing. I think that's where prayer changes things, becomes more of a weaponizing of fear. If you have fear, to weaponize your fear would be to use wisdom. Instead of acting from a place of fear and just hiding from the problem, be to act wisely towards the issue and to subdue that irrational fear so that um, these lower type of human behaviors that are instinctually protective of wealth and finance and power and control uh, are eventually uh, moving us in the right direction. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, tell I, me if I'm tell me if I'm misunderstanding <clears throat> this issue. Uh, my my sense is that uh, you uh, like spirit has its place and it has to in a sense stay in its place you have to come to it you have to surrender you have to open so i don't see how um uh, that level of intelligence from the spirit world if you will could get through to these leaders because they're so what thickly they're made of. encrusted if you speak to what they're made of uh-huh it's a little different you know that's where the high doses come in you know, but, but speaking, you know, Biden isn't going to take any psilocybin mushrooms. That's what you're not understanding. Is just like I, if I if I could perceive seeing through the wall yeah. on 15 dried grams, and I could perceive Biden himself and help him out on a spiritual level. It's like a tantra is transformation, and so Vajrayana tantri, tantras or tantricas would travel to all sorts of places without physically being there, without physically arriving or physically speaking to someone, and uh, be able to transmute a lot of uh, uh, toxic psychic energy that someone is facing or battling. And I think that uh, in order to help somebody make the right decision, sometimes you have to speak to them on a soul level. Mm -hmm. And uh, the soul sometimes will inform the physical decisions that that person makes if they feel that it's the right thing to do. Hmm. You know, and I've experienced this on one of my one of my last trips was we complain 
different peoples here who are even Native American, even including myself, you know, even with my little measly eighth Native American, you know, can can uh, start changing our worldview out of duality. Because when you don't exist in duality, in non-duality, we're not separate from each other. Mm -hmm. I.e. meaning what you feel, I can feel too. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so right. collectively having a great quote unquote prayer, utilizing our awareness to help these people in power to feel their decisions. Mm -hmm. It's no different than laying hands on someone in a church, but you don't need to actually lay hands on them at all because uh, the material that we're all made up of is spirit mm -hmm. and it is intelligent. And so to speak to the spirit of another person, all you need to do is to connect with them on a high dose energetically. And, and you'll see them show up like in your space, like a hologram, you know, and you'll be like, well, so let's talk to your to your soul. Let's talk to your your higher self and see what's going on up there. Oh, there's a disconnect. Well, let's 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 go ahead and and intentionally ask for that disconnect to be removed. Let's intentionally support this individual in his journey in a positive way. The only people who can do this are true observers. You can't go in there wanting to tear down government. You can't go in there with a state of anger or 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 upset. You have to be completely calm, level-headed, and non-judgmental to access the dimensions that I'm speaking about. That's fascinating. And and just to make sure I understand this, or that our viewers and listeners understand this, uh, you are saying that regardless of the mindset of the sort of receiver, if you will, mm -hmm. um, it is possible to influence them in a positive way mm -hmm. underneath their consciousness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's, and I, that's I, a powerful I, thought. I think that, I think that there, there's a secret service and then there's a secret, secret service. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. The secret secret yeah. service is what that eagle represents. Mm -hmm. And the presidents originally in this country made an alliance and wrote the Constitution. They utilized Native American totems mm -hmm. as honoring a part of this country that is not separated. And because the Native American peoples have been subjugated, a lot of the traditional practices that would include holding a nipi to even pray for a person in office. We know, we, you know the power of what can happen in a sweat lodge. When, when there are people who are focused not on themselves, but on healing not their, their community and each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. When people take the mushroom in a reliable, practical and effect, uh, uh, effective set and setting where they are not focused on themselves, they are focused on healing people outside of themselves, liberating humanity from suffering. Mm -hmm. When they're focused in that way and in that direction, we are like Arjuna on the battlefield with Krishna. We are guided by spirit what exactly to do in alignment so that beautiful things can unfold. Can unfold. And this war that's taking place, uh, we can be victorious over... Mm -hmm darkness in that war you know and uh krishna is the celestial general that exists on the emperor particle according to vedic hinduism as a supreme personality of the godhead and so when i take the mushroom that's who i want to talk to mm, i want to do the molecule of spirit on the emperor particle mm. and i want to know that i know that part of my journey as it is to function in alignment with it and when I'm functioning in alignment with it, when the world is crumbling and it seems like everything's going wrong, I know that on the infra particle, this is an experience of the divine happening and expressing itself. But that doesn't mean that I won't ask it for help. Beautiful. Yeah. So just uh, maybe one more uh, little line of thinking on this issue before we close up for today. Uh, um, when you're talking about that, it reminds me of uh, a psychic that I know. I mentioned him earlier on, a very powerful psychic. Uh, and he told me that um, 
the spirit beings or whatever they are um, are seeing that we're not getting it and they're making themselves more available now than they have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Do you agree with that? I think that the celestial beings like Shiva and Krishna and Vishnu and Brahma, etc., all exist in our particle reality, accessible by everyone, whether conscious or unconscious, as a part of their experience here, uh, holographically or metaphysically, however you want to put it. Uh, it's what we're made up of. And so I think that, yes, uh, we are in kind of a, some people would say a golden opportunity or golden, so I, I don't like the term golden era because that symbolizes something completely different. Mm -hmm. But we're, we have a opportunity to take the reins of our own awareness and use it for good. Mm -hmm. But if we don't choose to truly wake up to our actual state the actualization of our divinity if we don't choose to rise to that occasion with our with our consciousness with our awareness then we might lose a critical opportunity to enact real change to mm -hmm. enact world peace mm -hmm. which is really the goal and only peaceful people can do that you can't you, like I said, you can't just go in and storm the Oval Office on 20 grams of mushrooms and demand that everything be fixed. <laughs> Angry and upset. No, no. You, have to, you have to act compassionately. And if yeah. even more than compassionately, wrathfully compassionate in such a way that these these lower uh, frequency things that do exist and that, that are like parasites to people who are under stress, we see it every day with just regular old sick people, but we haven't even encountered like the sicknesses of our own president and and mm -hmm. and cabinet and Democratic Republican board. There is spiritual sickness there. Mm -hmm. Where there is spiritual sickness, where there is prayer, there can be healing, and I feel like that's across the board. Yeah, you know, but said, yeah, quantum prayer, living prayer, not just oh, I hope the government doesn't kill any more people. No, going in and looking to the source of that darkness and asking it to flee. Hmm. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. I hope people take that to heart. Uh, anyway, so that's great. Uh, well, there are lots more we could talk about. Maybe we'll have to do this again sometime, but I think that's enough for now. Um, you've given uh, people, certainly given me, a lot to ponder, a lot to sit with, a lot of inspiration. So thank you very much for that. So before we go, a couple things, uh, logistically, so to speak. Uh, I just want to mention again to people that um, please check out my website, stephengrayvision.com, and subscribe. I ask you to subscribe to my newsletter. I don't use it that often. It's free. It's just informational. It's all toward the kinds of issues that we're talking about here today. And also you, Acacia, is there anything I can put in the little titles underneath when I go into post-production on this uh, about something or more than one thing that you would like people to take a look at? Um, I have Global Plant Medicine is wrapping up in a couple of weeks, and I will be teaching a fall semester this year um, at Aztec philosophy, African plant medicine philosophy, uh, as well as the the full class, the full beginner's class for people who uh, want to learn more about these tools, techniques, and traditions that are contextually relevant to mushroom use and psychedelic use as a whole. And so if they would like that, they can go to my website, acacialewis.com under school and take any one of those classes there that seem interesting to you. Or um, if you are financially challenged or something, send me a message. And I, I do work trade exchanges with my students all the time and I try to make it accessible as possible to anyone who wants to learn. I have 200 gigabytes worth of footage that I'm currently processing to make available to the internet worth of classes that I've taught privately. And uh, yeah. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I'll just mention again that you will be back at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in Vancouver, November 1st to 3rd, spiritplantmedicine.com. Spirit and we're in the super early bird stage of uh, ticket selling now. So they're, the conference is not expensive as these conferences go. There are many that are much more expensive. We try to keep it reasonable and affordable for people, but we're also at the super early bird stage where they're even less expensive. So please, folks, come and join us for that because it's all about the kind of things that we're talking about today to uh, try to heal ourselves so that we can heal others uh, and you know add good visions into this world and good manifestations into this world. So on that cheery note, um, I'll say thank you and goodbye, Acacia. Although mm -hmm. please do stick around after we stop the recording. Okay, I will. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs>